So last Thanksgiving, my husband and I packed up our two-month-old baby and drove four hours to spend the holiday with my sisters in Massachusetts. We had been together for about a day when baby Andrew started to have a rough morning. Now this is the kind of morning that could easily be converted to a great one once one critical event took place. After about an hour of grunting and aching, Andrew's diaper was full, his cheeks were rosy, and I was relieved. So relieved that I felt compelled to make an announcement to an entire living room full of people. Don't worry everyone, Andrew just had a truly quality diaper. Great color, great consistency, great volume. While I was overjoyed, my announcement caused my sister to snap. Elizabeth, you are a smart woman. Can't you talk about anything other than Andrew's bowel movements? I froze. I quickly looked to my husband, who I knew would give me the, it's okay, don't listen to Kathy face. But to my horror, my husband wasn't able to give me the, it's okay face, because he was too busy gratefully mouthing the words, thank you, to my sister. So I did what any self-respecting new mother would do. I handed Andrew to the closest person, walked into the next room, and promptly burst into tears. Now, was my sister's delivery a little harsh? Maybe. But was the sentiment of her comment correct? Absolutely. And I'm thankful that she loved me enough to say something. You know, Kathy, a mother herself, was watching her once vibrant younger sister fade away into a duller version of herself, and she felt like she needed to jump in. So fueled by a combination of both embarrassment and determination, I knew that some changes needed to be made immediately. So on our way home, while Andrew slept and my husband listened to a football game, I started to type out my implementation plan for the rest of my maternity leave. From that moment on, I was gonna be on maternity sabbatical. Now, I've spent my career working in higher education, and as a staff member, I've always been genuinely envious that only the faculty are given the opportunity to take a sabbatical leave. In 1880, when Harvard University instituted the first sabbatical leave program, the plan was to give faculty a designated time to devote to a specific project, like writing a book or conducting research, but also give them a time for personal reflection so that they could come back to campus and provide innovative ways to connect with their students. If we think about new motherhood, like we think about higher education, we see that a maternity sabbatical is the ideal way to approach a maternity leave. Like the new mother and a faculty member, the mother should use this time not just for the main project, right, which is maternal care um, and bonding and, and infant care, but it should also be a time for personal self-reflection, personal growth and wellness, enriching self-study, and some time for professional reflection. What it all boils down to is this. If you as the new mother neglect to allow yourself to grow during this time, your whole maternity leave will solely be focused on the baby, and the mother will be left exhausted and uninspired and apparently only know how to, about to talk about diapers when reintroduced to adult conversation. So let's cut back to the car ride home from Massachusetts. I used that time to really envision what my maternity sabbatical would look like. I knew really clearly that I needed to have modest goals for every day, but I knew that those goals would only be beneficial to me if they were attainable. You know, those first months of motherhood are frustrating and exhausting enough. I went from being this incredibly competent leader who used to be praised for being able to put out five fires before 9 a.m. to a mentally and physically drained new mother who would be so frustrated because it took me a whole day to partially write one thank you note for a onesie. I knew that my perceived productivity was at an all-time high. So these projects or exercises had to be a source of accomplishment and encouragement to me and not just be another thing that I was too tired or too emotionally depleted to finish. I gave each day of the week a specifically designated theme, and these themes were specifically chosen to cover all of the areas where I felt like I was struggling most in my life. I never wanted to be the Thanksgiving diaper woman ever again, 
And that meant that I needed to expand my breadth of knowledge. So Mondays became devoted to my educational growth. I was on the verge of burning out at work right around the time Andrew was born. So his birth came at a surprisingly great time in respect to my professional fatigue. I knew that I needed to make some changes, but I wanted to take this time to really reflect on my career trajectory and my new needs as a mom. So Tuesdays were devoted to my professional growth. After reading that it costs conservatively $14,000 a year to raise a child, I realized that now more than ever was the best time to be as financially literate and savvy as possible. So Wednesdays were devoted to my financial growth. Nothing makes you crave cultural experiences more than feeling like you don't have access to them. So I wanted to find ways that I could, and I devoted Thursday to my cultural growth. You know, while I was never alone, I was the loneliest I had ever been during my maternity leave. Of all my new mother insecurities, being lonely was the thing that was most affecting to me. So it was absolutely critical that Fridays were devoted to my social and emotional growth. Now, like all new moms, I was ultra vigilant about my baby's health. But unfortunately, I wasn't giving myself that same care. After it took me six weeks to go in for some scheduled requested blood work, I realized that Saturdays had to be focused on my health and my wellness. And while I'm incredibly solid in my own personal faith, I did feel like there was a burden to impart my beliefs to my child, and that meant that I needed to study up. So Sundays were set aside to build upon my spiritual growth. Now, after I had the core of my maternity sabbatical outlined, I just needed to establish three basic rules. Rule number one, each maternity sabbatical enrichment exercise has to be at least and basically one hour, some as little as 15 minutes. You know, those first few months of motherhood are equally the busiest and most boring months of your life. So some days you could devote your whole day to an enrichment exercise, while others, just do the bare minimum. Rule number two, if an enrichment exercise stresses you out, walk away, no judgment. The goal of this program was to build you up as a woman and a mother, uh, not add to your anxieties. And rule number three, enrichments are not domestic in nature. Household chores are obligations. They're not fun exercises for self-improvement. So with all of that set aside, I went to bed and the night before I was about to start my maternity sabbatical, I panicked. Do I really need to do this? I'm already so overwhelmed as it is. Was I just trying to prove my sister wrong? You know, I really love being Andrew's mom, but sometimes I'm so bored. Is this my way of self-medicating an undiagnosed case of postpartum depression? Other women must feel like this, right? What are they doing about it? The BBC recently did a study of 1,000 women on maternity leave. And of those 1,000 women, over one half of them admitted to feeling extreme loneliness while on their leave. Over a quarter of them felt and admitted that they didn't enjoy their maternity leave as much as they had expected. And two out of five women longed to return to work early, not because they wanted to be away from their baby, but because they missed adult interaction and portions of their pre-baby social identity. Now, I think it's critical to note here that these women are all residents of a country that provides up to 52 weeks of partially paid maternity leave. Now, I know there are women listening to this who are thinking, this all sounds great, but when you're only able to take a few weeks off, boredom and loneliness are not my biggest concerns. And I absolutely understand. Horrifyingly, the United States is the only country of the 35 industrialized countries to not provide any sort of federal funding for a paid maternity leave. So American women don't just have to grapple with the positive, the negative, and the uncertain changes of motherhood, but they also have to think about things like, how am I gonna fund this leave? Am I gonna have a job when I come back? And did I give myself enough time to allow my body to heal? It's my humble hope after you understand the severely limited resources that our country provides to new mothers, that you take some time, whether it's only a few weeks 
or if you're using your maternity leave as a test run to maybe take an extended leave of one to 18 years, that you think about implementing some of these techniques. Because I truly believe that the care of the mother is equally as critical as the care of that beautiful baby. Now I'd like to use some of my remaining time to give you examples of some of my favorite um, sabbatical leave enrichments. So it's 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, and 95% of the people that I know are at work. The other 5% are new moms like me. And while I genuinely appreciate having these new moms to hang out with, it also means that we're dealing with some of the same social hiccups, like poorly slept nights that derail nap times and conflicting feeding schedules. So if you're lonely, but you're looking for a lower maintenance companion, consider expanding your friendships generationally. Right around the time I went on my maternity leave, the executive vice president of the college that I worked for retired. And it took us a few weeks to realize it, but soon we discovered that we were one of the few people in each other's lives that happened to be free during the business day. So we ended up getting together with the sole purpose of elevating one another. The best part about having Francis as a friend in my life at this time is that we were able to support one another when many people in our lives kind of pulled away from us. You know, we were once people who were highly in demand with back-to-back -back meetings every day. And then we went to a life where, at least in the beginning, we might have one appointment for the week. This was a time where we could build one another up, especially when a lot of people, you know, contrary to their opinions, Francis wasn't retiring to a life on a recliner. And I wouldn't always have spit up in my hair. We were still people of value. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to say, but you can never have enough people love your child. My dad passed away in 2018 and never got to meet Andrew. So I think it's particularly beautiful that Francis has embraced him like an additional grandson. And I'd like to take credit for this brilliant idea of calling on the retirees in your life for support and friendship but I stole this one from my mom. When my mom was a new mother with me, her best friend was our totally glamorous but octogenarian neighbor, Louise. And my mom often credits her happiness during this time to Louise's support and guidance. Next example. Pre-baby, one of my favorite things to do was go and listen to our local Philharmonic perform some beautiful music live. Post-baby, uh, attending these concerts was not really conducive with my new lifestyle. 8 p.m. concerts were smack dab in the middle of bedtime, and I feel like while people might appreciate that I'm exposing Andrew to great music at an early age, they wouldn't want to hear, see, or smell him on their night out. Thankfully, we live between two universities, both of which have music programs. So it was a total win when we found out about the midday student recitals. The pros were numerous. These were free concerts uh, that didn't conflict with a nap time. And if Andrew was fussy or tired or just didn't want to be there, that was OK, because there was no burden or pressure. Andrew got exposure to some beautiful music, and I got a little bit of my pre-baby cultural life back. I even dressed up on those days to make our dates a little more official. So. What do you do if you don't happen to live near a university with student concerts, or you just don't want to leave the house? Listen to Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein became one of my favorite maternity sabbatical instructors. And thanks to his televised Young People's Concerts, Andrew and I could have a world-class concert and a music lesson, all from the comfort of our living room. We sat together and learned about what is American music and what is a concerto, thanks to the wonderful people who uploaded these concerts to the internet. And the great thing about Leonard, he proves that our teachers don't necessarily need to be contemporary thinkers. He produced these concerts from 1958 to 1972. And yet, for us, that was our lesson of the day. Now, on one of my educational Mondays, I was watching a documentary on childhood development. And this particular documentary focused on the connection between a mother and her baby. And they used the still face experiment. Now, if you're familiar with the experiment, you know that the mother fluctuates between playfulness and disinterest, and the baby's response is monitored. 
Now, if you've watched it, you know it's heartbreaking to watch. But it also solidifies why my maternity sabbatical was just so important. This is a picture of Andrew on the day that I received my TEDx Scranton women's letter in the mail. Now, Andrew and I did our normal event of the day. We walked to the mailbox, he opened up the lid, and when I saw that trademark red lettering on the envelope, I screamed. And then he screamed. And then we started jumping up and down and cheering and laughing and mimicking each other's delight. That was an incredibly happy day for Andrew because it was a particularly incredible day for his mom. I had submitted my TEDx application as part of one of my professional growth Tuesdays. And I was honored that a committee felt like a project that had been a source of encouragement for me for the past few months was worth sharing with other women. That day was one of the first days that I started to feel like my Elizabeth. Now, am I chunkier than pre-baby Elizabeth? Yes, I am, and I'm working on it. Do I still struggle with some of the heightened emotions and insecurities that I felt in those first few months of motherhood? I do. Do I still sometimes, very publicly, talk about my son's diapers? Guilty. But for the first time in a really long while, I feel like I'm back, just with an absolutely beautiful sidekick. Thank you. <laughs>